Welcome back to Real Clear Radio Hour, brought to you by the Competitive Enterprise Institute. I'm your host, Bill Frezza. For the second half of our Independence Day show, we welcome retired Detective Howard Cowboy Wildridge, co-founder of an organization called Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. Howard, welcome to the show. Thanks, Bill. Thanks for having me. Howard, you spent 18 years working the beat on a police force in a small municipality in Michigan before you launched on this crusade, which I'm going to ask you about. Mm -hmm. Tell us a bit about that experience and what you learned there. Well, the biggest thing I, I confirmed was that, especially when it comes to marijuana, it was it's a horrific waste of good police time to go chasing a green plant <laughs> when there's drunk drivers actually killing people on Friday night. My 18 years taught me that the most dangerous drug by far available in the United States is alcohol. Mm. I added it up one day. Marijuana use consumption mm -hmm. resulted a grand total of zero, nada, zip, calls for service generated by the use. <laughs> in your experience. In my experience. Yeah. Alcohol consumption generated about 1,300 just about every night shift, and that included homicide, suicide, rape, child abuse, all the things that are horrific when it comes to human behavior. Wow. And yet society seems perfectly comfortable with selling alcohol from every corner store. Yeah. Well, we learned in the 1920s that you have the worst of all worlds with prohibition. Mm -hmm. You have all the whiskey somebody can drink and all the violence and criminality associated with the prohibition, black market, smugglers, etc., all the Al Capones, drive-by shootings. So we got rid of half the problem in 1933 mm. by re-legalizing, regulating, and taxing alcohol. How much marijuana use was there out in, in Woolbridge when you were serving on the force? Well, certainly uh, in, in, the, in the 70s and into the 80s and 90s when I worked, there was a, a fairly significant amount of it. Roughly about what it is today, we're, mm, we, we can guess around 20, 25% of the population uses marijuana mm -hmm. on a, a weekly or monthly basis. And were you instructed by the chief of police to aggressively go out and pursue marijuana users? My chief did not. A lot of the guys in my generation coming up in the 70s, mm -hmm. of course, had smoked marijuana in uh, high school, college, mm -hmm. and it just was not considered any big deal. Mm -hmm. Now, after I left in the mid-90s, more chiefs became excited about it because, one, it looked good, and two, they could make reports that showed that they were doing something, therefore would get free federal money, free mm. state money. And so this became very lucrative financially for departments to go after the marijuana user. Civil asset forfeiture came into play. So these factors came in uh, as I was leaving police work in the 90s. And how big a business has that become? Oh, it's huge. Local, state, federal, in a year, we confiscate, steal, take, whatever you want to use for a verb. <laughs> we're at right around north of six billion, B-boy billion dollars. So this is a huge slush fund, and it truly is a slush fund for every department to use as they see fit, wow. uh, absent civilian control. So marijuana control is, is just a huge business now. Oh, yeah, we consume. There's been various studies by, by the U.S. Congress and corporations like RAND. Somewhere in the area of $40, $60 billion worth of marijuana is sold every year in America. Mm. This is huge. It, it certainly funds the Mexican cartels on a regular basis. So you retired in 94 and literally hopped on your horse and went on a journey. To tell us about that. Well, Misty's Long Ride uh, was a combination of Paul Revere Ride and a personal adventure. Mm -hmm. I, I wore the T-shirt, cops say legalized pot. <laughs> Ask me why. Across the country, six months from uh, Savannah, Georgia to Newport, Oregon, trying to get people to talk about and understand that this new prohibition was as big a failure as the last one, and that as we chase the green plant and, and their aficionados, we miss pedophiles. We miss drunk drivers. Mm. And at the federal level, we miss people flying airplanes into buildings, about blowing up marathons, etc. This new prohibition doesn't help in any shape, form, or manner. And that's what I did for six months. If you ride your horse across America, Bill, you will get on TV. You will get on the radio and be on the front page of some papers. And how were you received by the citizens and, and officials you came across? Well, this was in 2003, and um, the reception by media was very positive. Yeah. I had no media campaign, but they would just simply come out to the side of the road and interview me. Yeah, A lot of cops would stop by in the middle of uh, Kansas or, mm -hmm. or, or, or Idaho and say, what in the world are you doing? And then one-on-one, -on -one, cop to cop, well over half agreed that nobody signed up 
to spend police time chasing a green plant. Mm. We all want to catch the bank robbers and the pedophiles and the drunk drivers, not people like Willie Nelson or Snoop Lion. So the rank and file cops pretty much were behind you. Oh yeah, oh yeah, no, uh, and that's if you're away from a camera, if you're away from a microphone, if you're away from colleagues, mm. they'll they'll open up. But they're intimidated to speak about it publicly. That's correct. In fact, early on in Leap, uh, which was formed in 2002, we had several uh, active duty officers speak off duty, out of uniform, to the Rotary, mm-hmm. disclaiming that they're all they're just exercising the First Amendment. Mm-hmm. And the first thing that stepped up like that were fired. Really? So that's pretty much gone by the board's active duty police cannot, because of the wall of silence, the blue wall of silence, they cannot come out and say anything, even off-duty and out of uniform. Well, so you've mentioned LEAP, the Law Enforcement Against Prohibition organization that you Mm -hmm. launched. Tell us more about that. Well, LEAP was founded by five police officers in the spring of 2002 to give voice to those hundreds of thousands of officers Mm -hmm. who believe our primary job, in fact, our sole job should be public safety. Mm. We've morphed in the last 40 years of drug war into your personal safety, trying to personally save a Charlie Sheen or an Elvis Presley from using uh, drugs outside of alcohol, tobacco, Prozac, and Valium. Mm -hmm. And of course, this is a fool's errand, has been from the beginning. We cannot protect individuals, nor should it be our business. This is best left to social workers, family, friends, church members, Mm -hmm. rotary members, people, family and friends fix family and friends. Mm. Tell us more about the membership of LEAP. Is it mostly retired police officers and judges? Who's involved? mostly retired police officers, judges, prosecutors, prison guards, probation, at all levels, local, state, federal. We've had a a guy from the DEA, 30 years in DEA, retired and joined LEAP a few months later saying, what I did for 30 years was absolutely without meaning, and we need to end this terrible policy. And it's uh, completely donor-supported, or do you take government money? It's completely donor-supported. That's the only way we operate. So, Howard, take us back to your ride across America and share a few stories with us about what you gathered on the way. Well, the important thing to keep in mind in the 21st century is the generosity of Americans is not lost. Hmm. Every day, Misty would be thirsty. I would (laughs) knock on doors. Almost always it was a woman alone or with small children. And they would look at me and go, oh, boy. But then they see this gorgeous uh, paint <laughs> horse in the background and, and say, what can I do? What's going on? I'd say, well, we're riding a horse across America. You know, could you help me with some water? And they'd come out of their house. They'd help water the horse. They would uh, then ask, are you thirsty? Would you like some iced tea? <laughs> I had, Bill, about 14, 15 women invite me into their home for lunch. And imagine you, a, a total, stranger total stranger, coming yeah. into the home <laughs> of your sister out in the middle of nowhere uh, like I was some long-lost brother. So it was a wonderful ride in the sense of reconnecting with the American people, especially as a police officer when you grow so cynical about everybody wants to hurt you sure. and everybody is mean and bad. This was a great way to rediscover America. And, and I suppose much of this was conservative country. How did they feel when you told them your story about marijuana legalization? Well, across America, it, it reflected the polls at the time. About 40% agreed, and the rest were going, I don't think so, mm-hmm. and they had you know, the gateway theory and and uh, not, not, I don't like your politics, but I want to help your horse <laughs> was a common refrain. But it, I mean, Idaho was uh, just say was the very best state. It took 14 days to ride across the southern part of Idaho. Wow. 12. Somebody took us into their home. Wow, that's really. And you camped out the rest of the time. Camped out the rest of the time. <laughs> sure. Did you get hassled at all by by police agents? Uh, short answer is not much. A little here, a little there. Uh, what are you doing? And, mm-hmm. uh, like, I, I, I camped out once in Tennessee in a riding ring mm-hmm. in the middle of nowhere. And three o'clock in the morning, the guy says, come out and talk to me. And I just, I just opened up the tent flap and I, I showed him my badge and I was not getting up at three o'clock in the morning mm-hmm. to <laughs> go talk to this guy. He came down and talked to me and we got along okay. And he said, well, they want you gone in the morning. I said, I'm, I'm uh, riding no across problem. America. No problem. no problem. So you got a little professional courtesy from your fellow cops. I did. Yeah, the badge still gets you a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> so, Howard, how many people are in jail today because of the drug war? Well, the, the bad news is there has never been a solid study on, on the exact number or the close to the exact number, Bill. You'll hear the number about half a million, but that's only people who are charged with a drug crime. Mm-hmm as in possession or sale, mostly sale. Mm -hmm. Uh, What those statistics don't capture 
are all the people in jail because a drug dealer shot a drug dealer. Mm-hmm. Or uh, the a person, and mostly for property. If you break into a house and steal, or you, you uh, steal a car, mm-hmm. or you rob somebody at an ATM, those are drug prohibition related because you broke into a house because you needed $200 a day for crack. Those stats are not captured. If you talk to people in the prison system, they will tell you what I realize as a detective. About 70-75% of the people in prison today are there for reasons which touch prohibition. Hmm. And that was true of my felony case law when I was a detective. Wow. And again, how come we didn't learn that lesson last time we ran prohibition? Because America is getting a D- in history and never forget the power of money and ego. Hmm. The uh, Working on Capitol Hill, they are powerful, powerful industries, not the least of which is the police prison industry, the pharmaceutical industry, the private prison industry are all four square against any type of legalization because it takes money right out of their pocket. And then, of course, the three hardest words in English, I was wrong. Politicians' egos will not handle the idea they were wrong on something for 30 years and say, you know, I made a mistake for 30 years. Prohibition's a bad idea. We need to do what our grandfathers and grandmothers did back in 1933. That's very hard for anybody to do, especially a Washington, D.C. politician. Well, it took presidential leadership. If I remember my history collectively, FDR definitely came out against prohibition and helped usher in its repeal. Correct. In 1932, the Democratic Party, in their plank, said we need to repeal prohibition. Do you think there's any hope of that with one of our political parties coming up? Not in the immediate future. The Democrats are too scared to do what's right, and the Republicans still have too much resistance from their conservative wing. Mm -hmm. The libertarians are gaining all over the place, including Congress, but to actually change the the attitude and the direction of the Republican Party is still several years out. Well, how many states now have either legalized or decriminalized marijuana? Well, you have four states that have it totally treated like beer, Mm -hmm. plus the District of Columbia. Then you've got another, I think we're up to 19 states treat marijuana in small amounts, like a parking ticket, mm-hmm. where there's no criminal uh, record, no, all it is is just pay the fine, mm-hmm. and you're fine. And what are the public safety implications in those states? Do we see any th- difference in the crime rates? The good news is, essentially, all major indicators stay the same. Like we saw in Colorado, uh, the most important stat that I, I pass out to Congress every day is that 17-year-old high school students are stubbornly, stubbornly refusing to smoke marijuana, more of it, just because of legalization. Uh, all the chicken littles were saying, if you legalize, you send the wrong message. And, of course, teen use will go up. And those chicken littles have been wrong for the last two years in Colorado since they've treated marijuana like beer. Well, if teens switch over from alcohol to marijuana and stop driving drunk, won't more of them live? Absolutely. In fact, we've seen a decrease in fatal accidents in the 24 states that have medical marijuana. For huh. a variety of reasons, those 24 states are, are using a lot less oxycodone less heroin because they're titrating, they're dosing themselves for pain with the high-grade medical marijuana, which reduces your opiate use. So the indicators are, in the macro, extremely positive. Now, marijuana has changed a lot, certainly since my days in college. They say it's a lot stronger than it used to be. Mm -hmm. What are the pluses and minuses of that? Well, certainly uh, for the smugglers, you can charge more for Mm -hmm. a smaller amount. For the consumer... It's actually a little bit safer because what used to take me two joints in college in mm-hmm. Michigan State, uh, you can now get in two puffs. Mm. And so you actually put less smoke into your body. The downside is you can certainly overdose on the new stuff, but it's important to remember that even as, whether it's an adult or a child, you go to any ER, talk to an ER doc, and I have, and the, the treatment for an overdose of marijuana is a couple of hours in a quiet room, until the effects of the drug wear off. They mm-hmm. don't pump your stomach. They don't shoot you full of drugs to make you induce vomiting mm-hmm. or something. They simply let you let the drug pass, and uh, then you go home. There is no real treatment for a marijuana overdose. Well, people smoke too much, fall asleep. Well, yeah, if you did. If, but the, the new stuff, yeah, you can do fall asleep or, you know, stay a zombie for a couple of hours. <laughs> but either way, it is not a true medical emergency where the EMTs and the physicians at the ER have to do something to save you from any any overdose, no matter sure. how, how much of a zombie you are. Like Maureen Dowd, of course, is a famous poster <laughs> child. She ate a, the whole brownie or something, and she I'm, I'm sure she had, from all a I've learned, a, uh, an overdose. But, you know, the next morning she woke up and she was 
fine. And she got a column out of it. And she got a column that was that is now the butt of every joke. <laughs> but you know, from that from that column, by the way, and other events, the legislature in Denver passed a new law, new rules and regulations for edibles. Mm-hmm. So now you have to state on the outside of the uh, of the package how much is in there. You got to cut the brownie into certain amounts of squares. Well, that's a good idea. Each square has so much marijuana. So the consumer is better informed if you don't know about marijuana going into it. Unlike my bottle of whiskey, there's no instructions on how to use it. (laughs) So in your experience as a cop, do stoners get in barroom brawls as frequently as boozers? No. Short answer is no. There's one job at a coffee house in Amsterdam uh, you will not find, and that is bouncer. (laughs) There are no bouncers in any coffee house in Amsterdam because... Marijuana is a euphoric, uh, euphoria mm-hmm. drug, unlike alcohol being a depressant, and people just do not become violent because of the drug. Hmm. So, Howard, you spend a lot of time in Washington these days. What's the scene in Congress on this issue? Well, Bill, I've been here 10 years now since the ride across America, and uh, I've seen a tremendous change that was brought about primarily because of uh, Ron Paul mm-hmm. pushing Republicans to all become little libertarians. And uh, this has made a tremendous difference at the legislative aid level, who are now pushing their bosses, the members of Congress, to become more Tenth Amendment, more states' rights, more libertarian. Mm -hmm. And so we saw for the first time in 2014 a winning vote on making marijuana a states' rights issue. Hmm. The House actually passed it, 219 to 191. It was my first victory party in 10 years in the U.S. Congress. So the good news is it is changing. bad news is it's going to take two, three more years into the new presidency before we we have the, a solid chance of repealing federal prohibition of marijuana and make this a state's rights issue, like alcohol, tobacco, firearms, and gambling, which are all controlled by the Tenth Amendment. I mean, isn't this a great out for conservative Republicans who can waive the Constitution and hide behind the Tenth Amendment and still come out against marijuana in their own states? Exactly. My governor, Governor Perry of Texas, did that a year ago. Mm-hmm. Big public announcement. He says, I'm in favor of employing the Tenth Amendment for marijuana, but back in Texas, I only think it should be decrimped. Hmm. And so now, you're exactly right. You've got guys as diverse as Governor Perry and Chuck Schumer of New York, the senator, hiding behind the Tenth Amendment saying, I don't think marijuana should be legal, but I think it should be a states' rights issue. And in fact, 59% of registered Republicans two months ago agreed this should be a Tenth Amendment controlled issue, which helps me sell it on Capitol Hill. Because the biggest thing on Capitol Hill is they want to be reelected. So now they can say a solid majority of the Republicans back in their state agree that Washington should butt out and let Illinois be run by Deal with it. And is this giving the liberals a little courage to come out and speak their convictions? A little bit more, but not when in the vote, they almost every Democrat, all but about 10 Democrats voted in favor of the 10th Amendment, the mm-hmm. state's rights. The Democrats approach this from a different angle, which is, you know, this has been, as I like to describe, the most destructive, dysfunctional, and immoral, immoral policy mm-hmm. since slavery and Jim Crow. Mm-hmm. And on that basis, Democrats vote against prohibition. Mm-hmm. They're voting in favor of changing it so that the states can end this horrific racial bias that is occurring every day in our streets of America where black and brown people are arrested way more than white people. Uh, even though both, all groups uh, use mm-hmm. marijuana in roughly the same numbers. Yeah, well, it's pretty clear that we're filling up our jails with young black American males. Oh, and boy. what happens when they get out? It's a mess because they can't vote, they can't get a job, they're saddled with that, that conviction. You know, as one of our members said, you can get over an addiction. Mm. You can never, ever get over a conviction. When I was out in California five years ago working for the legalization out there, I was approached at the Motel 6 by eight or nine Young black men, these are all separate mm-hmm. instances, separate times, and all saying, I'm 28, I got a kid, I want to get a job, but that conviction from when I was 19, 20 for a couple of joints is killing me and my ability to provide for my family. It was heartbreaking. Well, you know, we've now had three presidents in a row who smoked pot, one of which who did coke. I mean, mm-hmm. you think that, that the climate would start to change? Well, it is changing, just not as fast as we would like to see it, because there's no leadership on this other than a couple of congressmen, like Robacher of California and Farr of California. The leadership in this country is still too scared to forcibly come out in favor of ending federal prohibition mm. front and center and do it, other than guys like Ron Paul and Rand Paul. Hmm. 
So, Howard, take us back around to Leap. How is that organization growing? Well, Leap started out with five members, and now we're up over 50,000. Wow. We go to Rotaries, Kiwanis Clubs, uh, any place that needs a speaker, put on a presentation for 18, 20 minutes, and convince another 30, 35 Americans that if you have a drug problem, see a doctor. And also in the macro, our job should return to being public safety, not your personal safety. And I, I personally have been to 400. I've, I've spoken to about 10,000 people hmm. in an audience. And it really does make a difference when they, you could have Q&A afterwards. And that's how LEAP is doing its part in terms of informing the public as to the failure of policy. And let me just make sure I get this in here, that folks, you have two choices. These drugs are all dangerous, sometimes deadly. Uh, even marijuana is not a play toy, but you have two choices in life, and you know that today, and that is either the criminals and the cartels are in charge of, of these dangerous mm-hmm. drugs or the government is in charge of these dangerous drugs. We all know today there is never going to be such a thing as a drug-free America, so it's time to decide who do you want in charge of your drug supply. And I will vote every time to say I would rather have the, the government in charge as opposed to cartels who chop off heads, etc. <laughs> How can people find out more about LEAP or maybe get one of your members to come speak at their meetings? Sure, please. We have a speaker's bureau. Go to uh, www.leap, like leap year, mm-hmm. dot cc, Charlie, Charlie, and click on what's, what's there in terms of if you want a speaker, or we go to colleges, we go to rotaries, and we are free, and we'd be happy to come if there's anybody you know close to your area. We have speakers, of course, now in every state and about 64 countries. So we've got speakers everywhere. And uh, we'd be happy to help if we could. Howard, make a forecast for us. How long before you work yourself out of a job? Well, I'm h- working hard to uh, go home back to Texas, Bill. <laughs> in a, if we keep going in a straight line with all the positive developments, I could be out of a job in 2017. Mm, that's, uh, that's pretty aggressive. Well, I've been at this for 18 years, so <laughs> it's uh, three more years uh, is, is the minimum maximum probably uh, 2020, 2021. Oh, good Lord. Yeah. It's like I say, people don't want to admit to being wrong. And of course, the police industry is fighting this tooth and nail because we make billions and billions chasing a green plant uh, all over the country. Well, Howard, thanks so much for coming on the show to share with us and good luck in your quest. Bill, you're welcome. And thank you so much for letting me uh, speak my mind. That was Howard Wildridge from Law Enforcement Against Prohibition here on Real Clear Radio Hour, brought to you by the Competitive Enterprise Institute. I'm your host, Bill Frezza. Real Clear Radio Hour is produced in conjunction with Real Clear Politics, America's premier independent political website. Real Clear Radio Hour is a not-for-profit, donor-supported program. If you'd like to help us expand, please stop by realclearradio.org and hit the donate button or contact us to become a corporate supporter. That wraps up our show for this week. Have a safe and happy Independence Day, and join us next week, same time, same station. See you then.